just I have just clicked go live. <clears throat> we'll wait for some seconds. Hello everyone, good evening and welcome back to Bugbears NCBS YouTube channel. As you all know, we are a group at, at, at NCBS who are interested, who, who do computational uh, studies on bacterial genomics and regulation. And this is our outreach channel where we believe anybody sitting at home can understand science and research with, with a mere access to internet and these electronic devices that which we are surrounded by every day. So, uh, and uh, it is my pleasure uh, that like to, to tell you all this, that this is our second season or uh, we, we call it as chapter two. And in our chapter one, we successfully completed seven seasons with different researchers over a wide variety of topics and our audience uh, learned a lot and like we learned a lot about the wonderful research which happened. So today, uh, like the, this chapter two, which is which we are starting, we are talking about we will be talking about an interesting organism, like which you which you kind of see every day. Like everybody has seen it in their homes, in their kitchens. This, these are fruit flies, and these small tiny flies are have have an important role in scientific research, an important role in finding out what we have. Uh, achieved in science and research. So Mohawk, like when I when I talk about um, when I talk about these flies, like I really I personally don't like these flies like hovering around my head or in kitchen. So like what are we going to talk about uh, in, in our session today and who we have as a guest? Uh, tell our viewers about uh, what what our session going to be. Yeah, definitely. So like, uh, that's why we have gathered today. Uh, we will be talking about this uh, Drosophila melanogaster, which is the fruit fly, uh, which hovers over these fruits. And uh, that's what we are going to talk about, how this has changed research in general. And for that today, we have uh, none other than Dr. Deepti Trivedi from NCBS. Uh, she is the faculty in charge uh, of the Drosophila facility uh, and she did her PhD from University of Cambridge, UK and uh, then she went on to University of California, US to get her postdoc and she, uh, her PhD and postdoc uh, were focused on mouse and Drosophila genetics and uh, where she was studying the uh, intracellular trafficking in rod cells and motor neurons respectively. And uh, she joined NCBS in 2013, where as a faculty facility in charge, she provides support to the academia in their research. So let's welcome uh, Dr. Driti Trivedi for today's session. Hi, Nitish and Mohak. Um, thank you for inviting me for this session. Um, this, uh, I, I really appreciate the work you guys do in this uh, to bringing uh, research to uh, general public and uh, I hope to enjoy this and uh, I mean, yeah, let's start. Yeah, and we are excited to have you also with us. <laughs> so Deepti, like, um, I, like as I said to Mohawk also, like um, I, I personally don't like flies and so the important, and I, I, I really know a bit, bit about uh, Drosophila's role in uh, uh, science and research and how it led to, to this stage uh, at which we are currently in science and research. Now, why don't you tell our viewers, like who, who in their mind thought that this fly, like let's catch it and like let's do something about it and use it in like some kind of answering questions. So why don't you tell our audience about who was the for that, that who was that wonderful person who actually yeah. initiated uh, for that let me just share my screen uh, with everyone um, um, so this is the fruit fly that we are talking about it's called madrosophila melanogaster as just uh, mohak pointed out and um, it uh, people started to use this only um, at turn of um, uh, 19th century, actually, big, very beginning of 19th century. And um, these are the people who first um, 
started to use it. And um, here you see, uh, this is uh, uh, Professor uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan, who was um, interested in embryology in Columbia University. And he was wondering what organism he should use for this. And he had uh, a few students and they wanted to study the embryos and how it uh, development of any organism. Um, at the same time, he was very skeptical about Darwin's view and Darwin's uh, book had just gotten published and they uh, about evolution that things, I mean, we are, we have all evolved from some or, uh, organisms in the, in the, uh, I mean, um, uh, we, we are all evolved from some one organism and then we keep going and evolving and this is something he was very skeptical about and so he wanted to know is there an organism that he could use to actually see whether that is true and um, uh, and uh, some of his friends suggested to him that he could use this fruit flies which are very tiny and easy to grow uh, they are very fast growing as well it takes about 10 to 12 days to for a fly from uh, an egg to uh, become an adult and so he decided that if this grows so fast unlike humans you know it takes uh, our generation time is like 20 to 25 years right so we we give birth when we are 20 while flies they give birth on day one and and the adult comes out of it in day 10 on day 10 so that's why he decided to use this. Also, the ease of, ease of growing they just needed bananas, and on bananas they would just eat and uh, and and grow. Um, and uh, that's how he started. And um, he just revolutionized the field, as he was just saying that these flies. The, he was the first one. Um, uh, this his lab was the first one to uh, show that um, genes actually reside on chromosomes. So that was the big co contribution for which he got a Nobel Prize. Um, so so uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan's lab is what is credited for introducing flies as a genetic model organism. Oh, like, uh, Diti, first of all, like, I would like uh, to re request you, like, can you put this in a presentation mode? Like, uh, it will become oh, more clear. Sorry, sorry. Huh. Is it? Great. Okay, yeah. yeah. Fine now. So the, these these uh, thread-like structure, like uh, what are these? Like these are like chromosome, like the, our DNA that we have in uh, our cells. Yes. So yeah, that's a good question. So you know, you, as you you also work on DNA and you see that it's not visible, right? I mean, when you are looking at it. Um, so these structures look very robust, and this is exactly how it would look under a microscope. So it's not a single uh, DNA or chrom uh, chromosome molecule, but um, in insects and in many other organisms, even in us in some cells, they have these uh, chromosomes which actually um, uh, replicate but never uh, never come uh, uh, fall apart. So they, these are thousands of chromosomes uh, of a type uh, together, bound together, which never come off and they, they are bundle of chromosomes. So as you can see, these are called polyteen chromosomes. And they are present in flies only in certain uh, uh, organs, which are salivary glands. And this uh, chromosome actually made it very easy to actually know where each gene is located because of this very interesting banding pattern that you see here, right? So for, uh, just like we have um, um, different, I mean, flies have just four pair of chromosome, unlike us who have 23 pairs. And uh, this, uh, picture actually shows all of them and uh, people could actually know um, in each chromosome where each gene is located uh, at the end of I mean not each gene but large number of genes which at, at least had some phenotypes like you know eye color and wing shape and wing color and bristles I mean those are the very distinct feature of these flies and many of these genes which actually uh, decided the the specifics of these uh, could be localized on these chromosomes. So, mm -hmm. um, so that also told uh, told us that uh, genes actually are resident very linearly, just like a you know string, uh, a pearls on a string. They are located linearly, and um, and uh, and based on several experiments, they found how far they are from each other, and so on. Yeah. Okay. So. In our uh, monk, uh, 
so in our last uh, uh, sessions like in chapter 1 so das ended up with planaria as a model system right so i think uh, so since you can study genes and other things uh, which are there in uh, uh, drosophila and related to maybe humans i don't know yeah, yeah. so can can drosophila be a model system and if so how good and like how can we just use this insect to translate to humans animals or i don't know <laughs> yeah 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 so um, i i just made this uh, drawing uh, which tells uh, the some some uh, lo location in evolutionary tree of all the organism many of the organisms that you discussed in your previous sessions also so you see uh, the bacteria are here fungi and then planaria is here and uh, flies are somewhere the drosophila melanogaster is here and humans are somewhere uh, here right so we are all related evolutionarily to each other and as you go higher and higher up this tree uh, the model organisms that you see are much more closer to us as as compared to the ones which which are lower in this tree right so um, flies are metazoans so they are multicellular organisms they also have um, they have uh, i'll show um, sorry so i i this this picture right i just got it from a nursery primary uh, book where we see our body parts so you see that flies also just like us have these body parts right so they have eyes um to smell and hear they have antennae they have legs they have wings um they have a body they have a stomach abdomen you know and inside the body also they have uh different things like they have a heart and they have digestive system and their both body plan as you see our body plan as well as flies body plan and many other organisms of course have this left right symmetry right we have two hands and two eyes and uh, our body if you cut make a axis here it's symmetrical on both the sides as we see it and also we have this up and down right we have most organ i mean all organisms that we know in in this category they will have head at the top and then limbs uh, then the body and then limbs are as appendages um and most of the sensory like eyes and uh, antennae or nose and all these uh, things are actually uh, attached to the head so this body organization is conserved that means that even lower organisms such as insects and higher organisms as us or uh, mice or rat or guinea pigs or primates we all have this left right symmetry um and this and the uh, top bottom um, uh, plan and this was actually you know uh, it was first discovered in flies that we have this kind of plan and what are the genes that are responsible for this plan and uh, turns out that those genes are actually exactly the same that are present in flies as well as in humans and other organisms which are which are in that um, uh, those type of organisms so i'm not talking right. about now this unicellular organism and fungi and all but you know the higher metazoan organisms yeah so deepthi we have uh, two questions as of now in the live chat one is by ashwin and he asks uh, if these chromosomes come together do they do something interesting if yes what and if no why uh so you're talking about this right yes so um so um in case of salivary glands uh, apparently many of these uh, the genes are hyperactive and they are involved in some kind of release uh, but not much actually is known that the, i mean what happens when they actually come together so i am not uh, i am not aware of studies which tells me but the only thing which i know that they they are together is because they are hyperactive and many of the genes are um, involved because salivary glands have lot of releasing uh, function of many uh, molecules so they they are hyperactive in that case but uh, yes. yeah okay and and one more question uh, we can take at this point related to chromosomes only uh, anushka uh, asks if each chromosome has replicated many many times 
and all of them are packed together and are overlapping yeah. will transcription from these become difficult um so um they they also are, are in a dynamic uh, kind of situation and uh, the chromosomes which need to be transcribed in the salivary gland of course do transcribe uh, and there would be lot of regions which would be more packed but that is true for any other chromosome also so um, yeah yeah okay okay so yeah like um... Uh, the, just to uh, Deepthi and uh, Mohak, so it's interesting. Like, so uh, actually, Ashwin is uh, not directly asking this question. Harini, who is uh, his daughter, is asking oh. from <laughs> the account. Nice. So that's so interesting. Like, uh, we we have like young pop, young viewers who try to ask these questions. Like, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, I kind of left a story in between because I wanted to tell it and it, it didn't. Uh, yeah, so that's why I put this slide because it's interesting uh, is about uh, Thomas Morgan, who actually wanted to start studying these flies because uh, he was interested to uh, study evolution and he was growing and growing and growing flies, but nothing was really happening uh, in the sense that the flies all looked same and not evolving at all. And for two years, he was uh, just looking at the flies. And suddenly, because all these flies are actually red eyed, um, he saw one fly that was white eyed. And he was wondering why suddenly this white eyed fly has come. And apparently, he was uh, keeping this fly constantly in his pocket in a, in a while, of course, because he, he didn't want this fly to die or something for it to happen. And, uh, and then this was the very first mutant that uh, a naturally occurring mutant that he had found. I mean, after that, there were lots and lots of mutants that, uh, that he found, but this was the first one and it was so uh, close to his heart that apparently he also took it with him when his uh, own baby was born to the hospital <laughs> to show it to his wife. Nice. So, you know, that, that feeling of your first... Yeah. Child, really. <laughs> yeah. So, Deepthi, like you have told us, like uh, how the body organization of uh, like uh, this uh, fly, this uh, Drosophila fruit fly, is kind of similar with humans, right? And and so. Uh, if if those that body organization is somewhat disrupted or maybe uh, like some kind of change happens in the genes which we see in Drosophila, are there any any sort of uh, abnormalities that we see or uh, can we relate it to human abnormalities or the diseases that we have in uh, in humans? Yes, yes. So uh, yeah, I uh, actually I just uh, so you are right. I mean these uh, these uh, body plan mutants that you're body plan things are talking about genes. Uh, they are exactly the same as I said between fruit flies and humans, right? So they are even planned exactly the same way on the chromosome. Also, they are organized in the same way. So they are exactly the same. Um, so what happens is that um, um, so this is a larva, right? Um, it's a Drosophila larva and it has certain body plan and there, so th th there are, th these are called segments because there are these, um, you see these clear segments, right? So they are called um, thoracic segments and abdominal segments. There are of course head segments also, uh, but, um, but when mutation happens. So actually most of the Drosophila research is uh, in between 1940s and 70s was all about making mutants and then finding out what happens making these mutants. Exactly the question that you were asking was the question that um, that uh, motivated most of the Drosophila biologists between 40s and 70s because nothing much was known about DNA and sequences and or anything. But what was clear was that if you provide flies uh, with x-rays or some kind of chemicals like ethyl methane sulfonate or something which actually causes disruption in the genes that leads to these phenotypes. Some phenotypes meaning these characters 
just like uh, how um, you, I said, uh, Morgan was so happy to see this white eyed fly, but they come like after two years, he saw one, right? But you could mutate what he, what Muller, who was actually his student and also won a Nobel Prize much later uh, for uh, used uh, mutagenesis. Um, they showed that, you know, if you provide uh, these organisms with, bombard them with x-rays or make them eat uh, some chemicals, they get mutated. And when they get mutated, very strange things happen to them, right? So there, these are some of the examples where uh, mutations have caused uh, change in, um, in, in the body pattern. Here you see that um, uh, only four segments remain, the rest don't remain. Of course, these flies will never come out as, a, as an adult. Uh, because uh, they they are uh, they cannot survive only having uh, a6 a7 and a8 segment or or so on so they, they, there's loss of some segments happening um, which which turned out that are uh, and these these names that are written they uh, ruppel and hunchback and nerves these are the names which are given to these mutants by the scientists. So in fact, the uh, Drosophila biologists give very interesting names to their mutants just by looking at how they are looking, you know, just, just by the, the, the character or the phenotype that they have. So um, what, what basically all the Drosophila biologists between this time were doing was they were just uh, so Deepthi, feeding the flies. I have a question. Can you please uh, go back to the previous slide? Yes. So just just to be very clear, uh, so Kruppel, Hunchback, and Nerbs, these are the genes in which they found the mutations, right? In Drosophila. Yes, yes. So, so and so uh, these are also then conserved in humans as well. That's the reason why they could study the body patterning, right? Yes, yes. So many of the genes, not all, may be conserved in humans, but many of the genes uh, of body pattern are conserved in humans, um, and they. Uh, they have uh, more or less the same, uh, uh, I mean, they, they have uh, similar sequences and right. similar roles as well. So, so what, what I'm trying to understand is that more or less the pattern, the body patterning pathway is conserved from Drosophila to humans. Yes. Right. Okay. How much, do you have any idea how much is it different between Drosophila? Is it different at all? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, seven, it's, 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 uh, it is known that 60% of human genes are actually present in flies okay. and uh, actually 75% of uh, disease genes, human disease genes are also uh, present in flies, which makes it a very good model organism to study actually human, uh, human physiology is. and uh, function okay. and human genetics. Um, and, and, and just just one more thing uh, with yeah. adding to that thing. So could you also give any example uh, where... Drosophila might not be a good system to study some disease in humans, like for example, better to study in mouse or something like that. I mean, I'm just so, um, okay. I uh, I want to say something here. Uh, so it is always um, so even if there there are these seventy five percent of genes that are conserved in uh, in flies, um, yeah. the difference between human genome and fly genome even in those genes is the way they are regulated. So the regulatory elements okay. in humans are really very, very complex. While uh, fly regulation is not that complex. What I mean by that is that in humans, there might be three genes doing the same function, which one fly gene is doing. Okay, okay. okay. So this one fly gene will do all the three functions. Like for example, uh, if um, there is a gene A, which uh, a, B, and C in human. Uh, one of them works in, in, at endoplasmic reticulum, one in the cytoplasm, one at the plasma membrane, doing the same function. I see. Uh, but in, in flies, there might be just one gene which is doing, doing all those functions. Okay, okay, okay. okay. And, yeah. and so if you uh, lose one gene uh, yeah. in fly, you will see the effect of it very drastic. But right. if you lose that one gene in human, you may not see the effect because the other two genes may somehow compensate for it. And uh, but so the, the effect may be much more subtler in humans 
uh, than in flies. So that okay. also is uh, an important factor to consider in this. Okay. okay so gather like gathering all this information like it is being bit of too much for my head like because it's kind of new to me yeah. so you told that these small flies have like 60 70% almost identity with the humans right and when you say mutation so it means like if i uh, if there's some kind of change in the dna sequence of these genes yeah. you you can get these like hunchback nerves rupal kind of phenotypes right phenotypes like Yeah. The, the shape shape of the or maybe there is kind of abnormality that you see right so that that's so wonderful so we have one uh, like clarification which is by um, harini uh, that our drosophila uh, only flu, like the fruit flies that we find in our home are those drosophila melanogaster or uh, maybe uh, or there are other varieties of drosophila also we uh, get in our like homes so there are uh, in in the drosophila genus itself there are i think around 2000 species so okay. they are not melanogaster is not the only species and uh, in our home we may find either melanogaster or any other species also so there are some defining characteristics of them and we can uh, have a look at them and then figure out what they are so the fruit fly is majorly drosophila melanogaster uh, no. or just a drosophila no no so actually uh, drosophila is also not the only fruit fly there are all many other fruit flies also uh, in fact uh, dr uh, drosophila is actually not really a fruit fly it's not that in much interested in fruits it doesn't eat fruit it mm -hmm. actually eats decaying you you would see that once once the banana become start to become really black That's right. when these fly come. Uh, yeah, yeah, this so also I I also read somewhere that it actually feeds on yeast rather than the yes. fruit itself. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So it eats uh, it eats on uh, the yeast, yeah. uh, and that's why they they were actually earlier called vinegar flies, not fruit flies. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, this name has stuck more, uh, <laughs> and that's why they are called. Anyway, they are hovering around the fruit on these. Yeah. <laughs> but they are not the pests you know so fruit flies mostly the other fruit flies are considered pests because they may be eating raw fruit or you know um, uh, ripe fruit but you know what we can also consume uh, yeah. so those are the like like in mangoes you may see these uh, maggots inside yeah, of fruit yeah. flies so those are pests these are actually not pests so they they so, actually so these flies do not lay eggs in the fruits or uh, like no so they they are actually as uh, mohak just said they are interested in uh, yeast so mm. they are actually in the decaying fruit which is just lying after you know um, after being decayed quite a bit <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah 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 so uh, what i was saying here is that uh, you know um, uh, what helped fruit flies to become or drosophila to become extremely good model organism was for genetics was these uh, mutations which one could make um when uh, at will basically so here i am just uh, showing something to you which is that you could feed these flies with some chemicals which mutagenize their genome so there will be all these uh, chromosome with lot of mutations now these are going to be random mutations so we don't know what mutations they are but once you have these flies and then you get all the progeny these progeny as in uh, the the babies of these flies uh, those babies can be tested for any function right so as as we i we just showed this uh, these are also the babies of the flies which were mutagenized like that and you can see that all these babies or uh, you know the progeny have uh, these different different effects and if they are interesting effects then you can try to find out what gene is causing this effect um so you can check any phenotype and as i said from 40s to 70s you know very major discoveries for example the development which we just talked about but also uh, how vision happens um how um, uh, how olfaction happens so smell taste uh, seeing um uh, flying um, um all these uh, characters uh, were many of the genes and also learning and memory actually these were 
all between 40s and 80s people figured out lots of genes that are specifically involved in these of course the actual function of the gene was not known uh, because you uh, till the year 1999 uh, the genome was not sequenced uh, but at least a uh, lot of information about how many genes and which on which chromosome they reside and all that uh, could be known um, um, so uh, this this is uh, something which um, Nitish was just asking was uh, that how, what kind of characters can change when the body patterns change, right? And whether in humans also this can happen. Um, so um, this is uh, this is an example where you know uh, there is a complex of patterning called Bythorex complex, and uh, ordinarily flies have just one pair of wings, right? But if you have mutation in this complex. The flies can actually get two pair of wings, um, and uh, there is another complex which is called antenna pedia complex, in which if instead of antennae, uh, legs can grow out of um, out of where the antennae should be. So, um, so these are these are the problems which can happen because of the patterning, and uh, in humans also uh, people see these kind of things that. um and other other animals also that uh, if there is any problem with these patterning genes you can have uh, different kind of mutations and different kind of effects like for example multiple um, um fingers or multiple legs or um, you know things like uh, um different different kinds of things actually uh, can happen because is that an arm growing out of the tail Yes, yes. It was a arm instead of a oh. tail. In fact, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and also the, the here, for example, the because of a mutation in Hox gene, which are the genes which we were talking about, actually, uh, yeah. even the face has uh, duplicated. So these these are the these are the uh, problems that can happen if you have these uh, mutations in the genes which cause body patterning. uh defects so uh we have a couple of questions yeah um one regarding the polyteen chromosomes when we we talked about so mm -hmm. deepak sahani asked like why only salivary glands have polyteen chromosome and is there any some kind of pathway or mechanism that forces polyteen uh, chromosomes to be in specific organs only so hmm i have no idea actually that uh, i mean uh, that why polyteen chromosomes come in uh, um um only specific cell types um so i i do not know that but that's a good question okay and uh, we have uh, one more uh, question from ahana mm -hmm. and why do fruit flies mostly like bananas <laughs> uh fruit flies mostly like bananas because uh, uh they are they decay very quickly i mean if you don't eat them in 2 3 days they are basically almost towards the decaying uh, path right they become black very quickly and then within few days they are very uh, gooey and uh, so that means there is very quick growth of um, um yeast in it so uh -huh. uh, that's yeah. that's the reason why so is there like something which like these bananas might release which attracts them attracts the flies okay, yeah, of course so uh, um the uh, banana smell which is the ethyl acetate actually uh, uh -huh. smell um that's um, so so fruit flies have these olfactory receptors uh which means that they have on their antennae there are these uh, several receptors for different different chemicals right and they um uh, and they sense them and then the information goes to the brain and there are uh, some uh, some odors or some smells which are attractive to them and some that are repulsive to them so ethyl acetate is an odor that is very very attractive to uh, fruit flies and that's why from very far also they can go to uh, 
go to the bananas. Yeah. Oh, I see. So who who is this uh, person in the slide? Yes. So he is uh, he is um, uh, extremely well known uh, person, uh, Seymour Benzer in uh, in the fly field. And uh, as I was telling you about uh, all the uh, all the information that we have about how um, how vision works, how olfaction works, how learning and memory works, how circadian rhythms uh, work. Circadian rhythm, as in we uh, sleep at night and we wake up in the morning, and our day is divided into twenty four hours, even if. Uh, we are in a place which is completely dark uh, we will still go through this same 24 hour cycle just because we have genes that are important for this right um, so um, seymour benzer's lab actually uh, was the first one to do these genetic screens that could uh, that helped in finding of large number of these genes that are important uh for um, all these uh, physiological functions including um uh, you know learning and memory olfaction vision gustation meaning taste um and um, um yeah so these these uh, four things and large number of mutants were named in his lab uh, and uh, for example learning and memory is uh, something which you know we say that uh, person who is intelligent learns better right that's what we will <laughs> say if somebody is able to learn or memorize something very quickly that person is intelligent right and if somebody is not able to do that uh, we usually call them that uh, you no know, they they are almost like vegetable no like they, they their memory is like of that of vegetable so all the names of these genes has his lab named as these vegetables like oh. turnips <laughs> rutabaga you know <laughs> these kind of names which tells us that you know they they these flies don't learn anything so if you teach them you can teach flies by the way lot of things but if they don't learn they that means they have some mutations uh, in their uh, in their learning pathway so Yeah. So, uh, like, uh, Professor uh, Obed Siddiqui also worked with Benzer, right? Yes, yes, yes. He had uh, gone on a sabbatical uh, um, with him. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, in his lab, uh, he was working on these olfactory learning uh, mutants as well. Yeah. 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 So. Um, oh right so like I, i was going to ask this question so like you have talked about this body plan changes like i, I was like curious like in what way uh, ways drosophila has contributed apart from genetics so yeah, yeah. so as as i um, told you uh, apart from genetics there are a lot of things uh, which flies have contributed to um, one thing which i alluded to a little bit is neurobiology and um, uh, the the reason why flies ha have been very useful is just because we can grow so many mutants in just a small uh, space right so for example here i am showing that bangalore's population is like maybe 1 crore or something like that and you can actually put the entire bangalore worth of population of flies in just one room um so um so that is something which which is very uh, very uh, good because then you can actually study very complex things uh, in a very easy way in flies just because they, you can actually make large number of mutants and study each of them uh, specifically so as i was going for uh, uh, neurobiology um, the specific contribution of flies in neurobiology has been possible just because it's a although a very complex organism with lots and lots of functions like it also you you can think of any behavior and uh, that behavior you can see in flies also like for example aggression you know rejection if somebody rejects you in something uh, then how you will feel you feel dejected right you can go i mean some people can go and uh, uh, immerse themselves into alcohol flies do that actually if they are rejected they would start drinking more uh, you know uh also so they they are complex beings 
just that their uh, their system is a little bit smaller so here is human brain uh, a part of human brain and you see it's, it looks very complex it looks like somebody has, some child has drawn a lot of lines and these yeah. lines are actually the connections between brain and this this will never be same between two humans so if you wanted to study for example how this cell connect to this cell uh this type of connection you will see only in one person not in the second person right you will not see that but in flies uh these connections are very very conserved so every time you take this part of uh fly neuron you will always see that there will be one connection like this one connection like this one connection like this so so you can very reproducibly keep looking at this same function and see how it works and even um, the number of connections so these these round beaded things that you see are the the actual connection between a neuron and a muscle and the numbers you can count them right 1 2 3 4 5 6 they are exactly same uh, more or less exactly the same between the flies okay so um, so what i uh, uh, wanted to say is that just because of that one can study very very complex behaviors in flies just by looking at these small subtle things for example here you see if if for example there is a mutation which causes some kind of very aggressive behavior let's say uh, so you can see the brain how it is in the, those uh, flies and you can see that here uh, the the synaptic connection looks like this but then in this fly it has become very very uh, much more complicated and that tells us that there might be more activity or some kind of more activity in this kind of uh, so diti what is the fly on the right the t figure like yes. how is it different from the one on the left yes so this is this is how a wild type looks and okay. this is some mutant i just didn't uh, really some gene you mean uh, some mutation in some gene which okay. increases the number of synaptic connections okay. i mean the connections it just increases the number of connections okay so, also one more doubt i had diti can you please go to the previous slide ha huh. so like you mentioned that this this is again which was very new to me that uh, in drosophila all these connections are exactly the same unlike humans right which ha can have these connections different so that makes it a, it a great system to do experiments and you know study what gene effects could have but otherwise uh, is there a reason why humans evolved into having uh, different connections with, within the individuals versus drosophila having same exact connections i mean No, okay i i should have uh, mentioned a little bit uh, differently this so this is this is brain right, right. and this is a neuromuscular junction okay. it's brain and uh, muscle junction um the reason why we are comparing brain and muscle junction with human brain is because of the kind of uh, chemical uh, it releases so human uh, brain uh, synapses or the connections are are glutamate based so glutamate is released and glutamate is is the one which uh, signals from one neuron to the other uh, in flies that is the same for neuromuscular junctions so they are glutamatergic fly brain cells are not glutamatergic so when we are studying glutamate based uh, connections we are usually looking at uh, the neuromuscular junctions which are very very um e exactly same for any fly that we are looking at yeah so that, so, so, so these connections like uh, uh, the are these are these connections identical uh, across like in flies like so they will not be exactly identical but what i would say is like for example if Uh, in a uh, on a muscle like muscles and neurons they are they are numbered also so let's say mm -hmm. muscle 2a and neuron 2a make connection and they would make 17 to 20 synapses so it will have some plus minus it will not be always 20 synapses and not 21 and not 19 but you know there would be 
uh, some 17 to 20 connections, but that would be true across uh, all the flies and even across the segments if you're looking at the larvae. So across this, so I, as I showed you in the larvae, there are many segments, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look, uh, so each segment have the same set of muscles and same pattern of muscles and uh, and the neuron which make connection to with the with the with that muscle will be more or less uh, same numbers. A follow up question with that: Like, are these connections associated with some some kind of learning in flies? If yes, then how? Okay, so yeah. these neuromuscular junctions are uh, not so much about learning. Uh, of course, there is that kind of learning as in which we also have between neuromuscular junction, which is uh, when you use a muscle more, the connections become stronger and though that kind of, but the sense of learning that you perhaps are talking about uh, okay. is uh, is more related to the, the brain, right? right. Um, um, so in neuromuscular junction, that, that kind of learning will not be there. It will but, be but, but in brain, uh, uh, new, uh, like the connections between the neurons, yeah. So if, if, if like a new uh, thing comes to the fly and learning happens, so does that have an Im Im effect on number of connections or I don't know, type of connection on, in some sort? Yes, yes. So the, uh, so as in, in the brain, it will happen exactly how, uh, I mean, uh, the connections are strengthened by the number of synapses being increased. So the number okay. itself will increase and there will be a strengthening which would uh, be based on uh, the signals that are going from both the presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron, like both the neurons which are making the connections, they, there will be these signals that are going from each other, making that connection much, much stronger. And also Harini asks one question, because Drosophila have exactly same patterns in the brain, will they know exactly the same thing? <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, so, um, and so as I said, this is more about the neuromuscular junctions. Okay. Um, in brain, they will have a lot of plasticity, meaning that there will be changes in the connection based on what they learn and uh, the connections will keep changing based on what they are learning. So uh, within the brain, that is going to be uh, different. They, they will have different learning experiences and you can teach them different, different things. You can teach them, even if they like banana smell, you can teach them to hate banana smell. <laughs> you can teach them that. Um, so, because um, they, in fact, as I was talking about Benzer's lab, they did uh, study these uh, olfactory based uh, uh, electroshock kind of conditioning where uh, they could uh, give a smell of banana. Uh, I mean, I don't know which smell they give, gave actually, but you know, you could give a smell of banana and um, at the same time, give a slight shock to the uh, larva oh. and, uh, and then train them so that they don't like that smell anymore. So this is like without any genetic perturbation, you are training them, right? Yes, yes. Without any. So then wow. if you have this assay clear in your mind, yeah. Then what you could do is you can also test it with the mutants uh, and then yeah. see whether they, yeah. they are good at learning the electric shock or they are bad at learning. Nice. So wow. the positive reinforcement and the negative reinforcement can very well be studied. In fact, in Obed Siddiqui's lab, uh, there was a lot of uh, this kind of work being done where you could actually change the preference of the flies and also one could study whether this can be done at a short term only or long term or intermediate term how you could actually uh, training also does not last forever right if, yeah. if you have to eat also right. so you can uh, change that so, so Diti, you have talked about these like um, uh, the electric shock assay right mm -hmm. so um, i mean like with humans and then you you also told about that uh, we can study uh, humans like and different diseases associated with humans using drosophila so like how do we get to know like if, if i want to know about like if i have some uh, if i want to know about diseases associated with my muscles or heart or some sort of organ so and drosophila i don't think so like like as you told that 
they are very tiny and the, uh, like our size brain size is differing from them and heart is also different the organ system is different so what kind of assays that we can use with drosophila to study human uh, diseases or any kind of abnormality so i'll give you a couple of examples um so uh, this is one example let's say your muscle thing you're talking about right yes. so um, our muscle defects are very subtle right sometimes you are able to do something with your hand and sometimes you're not able to do and uh, they, there can be some genetic so drosophila is mostly has mostly been used to uh, study genetic basis of diseases right so i'll uh, show you this video and you see what you see here um, are you able to see so the yeah. fly is actually stuck on a cover uh, on a slide and then there is a ball and it is able to pick that ball and it's able to roll the ball you see that um it it so the fly is actually now completely holding the ball on its own yeah you see that yes. so um so if you have set up this assay and this assay was set up uh, by aman agrawal in uh, professor vijay raghavan's lab um what you can now do is you can see that if there are any mutants who are not able to hold this ball right so even if uh, and then you can try to figure out if you have a mutant which is not able to hold this ball then uh, then the point the question is that what is the problem with the mutant is the muscle is not uh, proper see there can be injuries also so you will have to test many flies from that uh, same vial but if you forget about injuries and all uh, if you are only focusing on the genetics then you will have to uh, see whether it is because of the muscle is it because there is some problem in the brain is there no motivation to hold this ball or is there something related to neuromuscular uh, connections from brain to the muscle from muscle to the brain all these connections can have a problem and that can be genetic and uh, th these are the things which can be very specifically studied because you can actually cause the mutation only in specific cells also like only in the brain only in the muscles uh, only at the the junction between the nerve and the muscle so you can uh, cause that and then you can study these subtle defects um so another uh, very nice example is uh, this uh, these are uh, you see these flies so on your left is a, a wild type fly meaning no mutation and on uh this is a fly actually both of them are same flies but you know it has a temperature sensitive mutation uh you can cause that that means at high temperature at 30 degrees it will start behaving like a mutant at room temperature it will behave like a normal so you see normal fly walks like that but the moon walking fly oh. goes backwards <laughs> wow <laughs> and it turns out that there are only two neurons in the flies that control this behavior so you can walk backwards right everybody can walk walk backwards but it's slightly difficult right because for walking forward you need different sets of brain, uh, brain cells for walking backwards you need different si sets of brain cells and here in this uh, what they are they have done is they have only activated those cells that are required for backward walking and not the one which required for forward walking and you can do these kind of experiments in 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 flies and uh, then you already know that those are the only two cells that are important so does that mean people who can moon walk in dance <laughs> and those who can't these neurons are responsible <laughs> <laughs> they may have made some strong connections there <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And other disease, uh, Nitish. Uh, other diseases like epilepsy. You know, epilepsy, right? There is sudden yeah. activation of our uh, uh, body. I mean, uh, brain. There is lot of activity for a short spurt of time, and then one gets better. So there is an example here of uh, a lion getting some kind of epilepsy, and you see. Uh -huh. I mean, you. 
Yeah. You see that it, for a very short time it will happen. That whole body is shaking, shivering, and then uh, then it comes back to uh, its senses. So it so happens that this kind of uh, behavior is caused by activation of large number of neurons or nerve cell or brain cell in our body, uh, in our head, and uh, this same behavior can be also seen uh, in flies. So uh, and and turns out that the same mutation causes this behavior. So you see, um, there there are two vials you see of flies right here. Right. Um, so on the left side is the mutant fly, and then right side is the uh, wild type fly. And you overstimulate it by shaking it vigorously, and you see that epileptic flies they are actually at the bottom. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And the uh, wild type flies are now back to normal, and they also mm -hmm. have that same twitch and same shivering kind of uh, behavior. So uh, mm -hmm. both are caused by activation of a channel that uh, uh, that uh, basically uh, hyper uh, polarizes the cells of the uh, sorry depolarizes the cells very quickly in the brain. So there is a hyperactivity of brain cells. and that's why every muscle starts to move at the same time um so these this mutant was also first discovered in in flies actually so deepthi i i might have a naive question at this point like you showed this video on the right um phenotypically just by looking at it uh, how do scientists uh, differentiate between if this twitching thing is happening as an epilepsy or yes. some other thing i mean yes so just by phenotype you will not be able to say but uh, but as any drosophila uh, experiment uh, forward so these are called forward genetic experiments where i just said right you first make all the mutants you have large number of mutants let's say 100000 different mutants or uh, a million 100 mutants a, mi a million mutants or something like that and then you test all of them okay so you take all of them either in one one batch or in different different batches and you test all of them and whatever is twitching then you make a stock out of it meaning that you uh, okay. mate it with some other uh, um, uh, some either male or female depending on and then make a stock out of it and then check whether this phenotype is uh, yes. again Uh, happening or not okay. so you will have from these 100000 mutants you will have maybe 10 or 15 which are showing the same behavior right. and now that uh, we know the sequences of genes and so on you can actually find out which gene uh, the mutation is in and then you can start to study the function of that gene so that's what what is the step by step process of how you find out um, mutants i'll give you an example of uh, uh, these uh, mute uh, so you, you know professor uh, k s krishnan he was working on these uh, um, uh, mutants uh, which uh, which paralyzed uh, based on um, uh, which had some kind of paralytic effects based on let's say so the, he had made this uh, uh, this equipment called inebriometer which was to study the effect of alcohol on uh, uh, on on the flies so how much inebriated they would get and uh, flies which are which get really drunk will actually fall down while flies which don't get drunk will keep flying right so you can mutagenize then flies and then put it in there and then if you if you put flies inside Uh, any um, let's say vial or bottle their natural tendency is actually to start flying immediately but if they can't fly they they will actually fall down so you can then pick up those flies and see why they are falling down um, nice. and then study their genetics also so there are there can be these kind of so the main idea is to find a correct assay for your uh, question first like Uh, as you were saying that how do we know that that twitch is caused by um, epilepsy mm -hmm. so we know that this is caused by epilepsy just because more studies were done following it um, uh, 
but then once your assay is there, it's um, relatively uh, easy to then uh, find the mutants which don't don't do what you expect them to do. And Harini asks one question. I really like this question. She hmm. asks, uh, when Drosophila learn together, hmm. will their brain change in the same way? Oh wow! Yeah. So um, in a while, I mean, in a um, so when when you usually do these kind of experiments, you make sure that they have grown in the same a vial, for example, same bottle, and they are genetically exactly identical. And uh, uh, so, so all these, and they, they are same age. Um, all these things are taken care of um, so that you see a very robust behavior, which, which means that they should learn exactly the same way. But uh, when you actually do the assay, you will not see that all the flies, for example, if you want them to go from one, uh, one place to the other based on some kind of smell, let's say, right? Uh, so you put a banana on the end of some tunnel and let's, uh, let all these flies in, be in one place and let them uh, go. So we say that they have learned very well if let's say 90% of flies uh, go to the, 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 the final destination, which is the banana, uh, which also means that 10% did not go, right? Yeah. Uh, so maybe they don't, even if they are genetically exactly same. So now think of us because we are never genetically the same except for maybe Harini and Hamsini. Um, then how and and they they are also so different from each other, right? So you know uh, we don't we can't expect people to learn or think or do exactly the same way at all, you know. Uh, even exactly hundred flies which are exactly genetically same will not behave the same way. Okay, so Aditi, um, like we have talked about these uh, uh, diseases that we find in humans, right? And how we can uh, um, learn using Drosophila as a model, right? So what about those genes which are like 30% uh, part, like which is not uh, common to human and Drosophila? And can we use Drosophila to study those kind of genes also or those kind of abnormalities that we find in humans? Um, yes, so people do use uh, Drosophila to study um, uh, those kind of genes also. So uh, uh, what people do is something called a misexpression screen, uh, okay. which, which means that uh, um, usually that gene is not present in the, in the flies. And one example here is uh, A beta 42, which is actually present in humans and uh, not in flies. Uh, but if you overexpress, meaning you take the human gene and put it in the flies, um, you, uh, using, uh, in, so here somebody has put it only in the eyes and you see the eye has become completely like almost missing. There is only small part of the eye is left. That means the eye has degenerated somehow or it, it's, it's, it's dying or it's, uh, the eye cells are dead basically. So why should one do that? Just to know that, you know, if you overexpress a human gene, then uh, then it is uh, it becomes bad. So what? I mean, it, that's fine. But then what can one do is use this C as the model to either feed these flies some drugs to see if you can make it better. So then, then people do use it for drug discoveries like that. Or you can do use some genetic methods to make it better. Like if you, uh, in addition to adding this A beta 42, you make some mutation in the fly and see if you can make it better. So that kind of studies help to see that what are the genes that interact uh, with a human gene and, 
and can then uh, uh, can then be targets for some kind of drugs in in humans for human diseases so yes even even many of the genes which are actually not present in flies are just expressed specifically in flies for these kind of screens so uh, since we are uh, like uh, close to one hour uh, since we have started this session and um, um mohan do we have uh, uh, questions yeah, yeah we got one question from anushka sachdeva do we have time nitish should i ask yeah yeah we can ask uh, uh, questions uh, for now and then maybe we can uh, go towards the end of the session about what deepthi does uh, in flies facility at uh, ncbs instant campus oh, okay 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 uh, so uh, anushka asks uh, like in humans it is believed that kids learn faster is this the same with flies um yes apparently so there is a very recent research uh, i mean there are more research from before also but um, research which shows that uh, younger flies uh, learn much better much faster uh, than adult flies also younger flies sleep longer than adult flies just like <laughs> and if they sleep better they learn faster also just like humans so yes younger flies which are just 0 to 2 days old those are the flies which learn learn the best actually okay yeah do we have any other questions no i think uh, ashwin uh, just uh, put a remark even diluted alcohol can harm flies as they are very delicate yes um what what is no it it uh, continues from our discussion on alcohol like we were discussing right uh-huh. before yeah 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 even diluted alcohol can harm flies yeah yeah it is flies. it is pretty pretty diluted but but uh, flies can very easily become alcoholics actually okay <laughs> and they also have withdrawal symptoms and all that oh <laughs> so yeah i i can see like one one more question from an uh, nagi shesh uh, um like Can, like as we as we can, as we make changes in drosophila and then they change behavior can we uh, do something with humans they also change they change their behavior can we do that <laughs> um i i am pretty sure there would be ethical issues i i don't think <laughs> we should do that uh, i mean that is my personal opinion uh, and also opinion of a lot of people that uh, Uh, with humans we should uh, only uh, change uh, i mean make genetic changes only when it is really required otherwise the person is going to die or something like that otherwise the society we don't want them to be 100000 exactly same kind of clones which have exactly the same behavior we really need diversity right so <laughs> even if somebody you think is a badly behaved person i think we need that person <laughs> so uh, uh, like you mentioned about the ethics now uh, i am just curious to know that uh, in terms of ethics just within model organisms uh, do we also have challenges like different levels of ethical issues for let's say drosophila versus mouse and like, how do you decide absolutely absolutely i mean uh, flies are one of the model organisms with uh, which does not even come under any ethical issues um so so that's why it is easy to research uh, on flies while mice and ir organisms they have lot of uh, um uh, so researchers will have to tell exactly how many mice they are using and whether they can reduce the numbers and uh, what are the i mean if if certain experiments will cause pain to them then how that can be reduced i mean there are a lot of things which which needs to be taken care of when you are uh, working with higher organisms uh with flies there are no such uh, um, uh, guidelines as such um just because it doesn't come under uh, any of these uh, protocols Okay, so we are towards the end of our session, and uh, why don't you tell our viewers about like what you do at Fly Facility and why is that be, having a Fly Facility at a research institute is important? Yeah. To- yeah. So at the Fly Facility, as I said, that there are these all these mutants that are uh, needed 
uh, for research right if somebody wants to study um, i mean any kind of uh, behavior or any kind of uh, gene or very specific uh, genetic mutants uh, they they need these mutants so many of the mutants are actually because of the fly community being very generous are available in these big stocks stock centers so flies have around 14000 genes and uh, for those 14000 genes there are maybe 100000 different fly stocks available um and they can be uh, so but then all, not all genes are covered but many genes which are very uh, very uh, much highly uh, studied genes will have multiple kinds of mutants available so um fly facility our fly facility uh, maintains a large number of fly stocks uh, which are fly mutants which are very specific for the kind of questions our researchers are asking uh in addition to that we make a large number of uh, mutants as well ourselves um which are either these kind of mutants which you just see here like human genes being expressed in uh, in flies or any other organism genes expressed in flies or uh, fly genes themselves being over expressed in flies so sometimes you have the genes but you want to over express a mutant version of it to see what happens so those kind of uh, uh transgenic these are called transgenics which we make and we also want to sometimes uh, researchers may want to see that what happens if we just change the shape of this protein from this way to that way or something like that which also then means that uh, a point mutation or a small mutation in the genome can be done to make that protein uh, different so those kind of things also we do so we make lo- a large number of such mutants in the facility and uh, and also uh, we have observed that you are involved you are like quite uh, involved in doing science art like communicating science through art uh, can you throw some light and uh, to this field of, uh, of sci art and how it is important like how and is it a growing field or what do you do actually yeah so um i so in my mind i mean i i am in my mind i'm not really a sci artist as such but what i what i try to do is uh, just to make people interested or curious about uh flies uh, usually so i like i really make lots of and lots of flies of different types and uh, different kinds of structures mutants their inside body organs uh um, uh different cell types what they have um so i i do that kind of work just and then i just keep posting it on social media i think that that's the main part of it because that makes people uh, curious about what this is i sometimes ask can you recognize this body organ from the fly or you mm-hmm. know something like that just to just so that there is some awareness and activity and um, yeah so so i in in addition to that i also sometimes organize uh, art things within campus um we have made this uh, sci art group which uh, keeps posting different kind of um, uh, sci art things and uh, we meet each other currently online only but you know uh, usually earlier we used to meet every friday do some art together um, yeah so so those are the things which we do yeah oh, great so anybody who is like a uh, viewer and interested in sci art maybe uh, contact deepthi <laughs> right so great and do you, do you have you, an insta instagram page where you put your artwork yes i do have instagram page but i i yeah i usually tweet them actually okay um, but i can uh, i mean i have put some pictures on instagram it's just that i'm not very instagram savvy okay <laughs> maybe then as a in a mailing list we can give your tweet uh, twitter handle yes. or something like that okay. so that people can follow you absolutely great thank you deepthi for joining us today and like uh, commencing our uh, uh, chapter 2 of we can chat with researchers and it had been very nice session 
like i personally got to learn a lot like i never saw drosophila i in this zoomed level like i thought these are so tiny organisms which are just hovering around fruits and have no work to do <laughs> yeah yeah i have to show you this i mean you, this will yeah. uh, this will be mind boggling uh, they are this is their heart oh <laughs> oh yeah so they have everything that you have <laughs> almost <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we have to give respect to them. <laughs> okay, then uh, here we are. Uh, um, thank Deepthi. Uh, so, and so to for our viewers, thank you all for staying uh, this long and um, giving your uh, evening Saturday evening to us. And maybe uh, I, I expect like you have learned wonderful uh, facts about Drosophila, and. again uh, so as the ending remarks i say that anybody sitting at home can understand science it just needs bit of motivation internet and some device that you can uh, search <laughs> do google search youtube search or anything like that so um, as i always say in my chapter uh, in in the chapter 1 chapter 2 of the season do follow subscribe and share our videos and join our outreach uh, initiative and feel free to contact us uh, and uh, i have um, uh, as a, as a bug bears and cbs we have posted uh, the link in the chat box in the live chat se session you can like you can go to those links go to past videos and do uh, do the science outreach and get involved in it that's it so thank you all and uh, here we uh, take off Bye.